Uh, David, I did want to come to you on Mark's question, which was, um, it, I think people worry a lot about risk assessments. And whilst some people feel very confident making them and feel clear that, as Mark's describing, it's a practical assessment of what you're trying to do, what you're able to do and mitigating risks as much as you can. In terms of this constant question that's coming up about how often we need to sanitize play equipment in playgrounds, do you think that there is um, that it would be easy to to argue the point about why you'd made the decision you'd made if, for example, you decided that you cleaned a playground once a week or once a month, or in fact you you left it to the to the parents themselves to ensure that children were washing their hands and using sanitizer in, because you don't have the capacity to go and wipe down all the equipment? Yeah, um, right. Well, this is a very interesting question about risk assessment, something obviously I spend most of my time working on. Um, and I think Mark hit all the buttons. I mean, I think that uh, it would be quite easy if he had a bit of access to the literature to write and I would say a risk-benefit assessment rather than a risk assessment of the playground in relation to COVID. And what you should do in there is cite the evidence, which you can get via the Play Safety Forum and the papers which have been written about COVID, that um, the risk of um, fomite transmission in playgrounds is actually almost certainly very, very small, if non-existent. So if you can cite that evidence that that risk is small, then that means that any control measures that you're thinking about are going to have very little effect. So if the control measure is arduous, time consuming, costly, difficult to control, then there is not a case for implementing it. So I, I would urge people to try and do a sing simple risk-benefit assessment in relation to COVID and write it down on a bit of paper. That might deal with the situation which someone, the question which someone raised earlier about the hospital, which was reluctant to let children use the play area. If there were a documented risk assessment which showed that the evidence which, uh, that uh, transmission via play was small, um, that might convince people who are of that mindset, who need these bits of paper. Thanks. It, it sounds like a key message is that the main transmission, which we know, is between people to people. And that's the thing that we're all focusing on throughout our lives as grown-ups, as well as for children. And so that's the question that we've got, really, isn't it? About how important is it or what is the detrimental impact of uh, trying to implement social distancing between children. And I think we touched on that a bit earlier, Helen, but people are still thinking about that. The impact of, of trying to get children to play in a socially distanced way. Is that what we should be doing? Um, that seems to be the message, for example, even in a sandpit. It depends how many children are in there, I presume, and how close they are to each other. That's where the risk is, not from the individual grains of sand uh, that yeah. have been mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, children, the more children there are in a small space, even if they are outdoors, if they're close together, then they increased risk of aerosol transmission. OK, that that's clear. The government guidance is that children, you know, if they're just playing at the park or whatever, then they should be socially distancing as the parent and as a psychologist who knows how difficult it is to convince particularly young children. You are, I mean, I think we talked about older children earlier, right? And the challenges are different for young children. It's getting them to understand and realizing that very young children simply do not have the control over their actions enough to stop themselves from going up and being close to other children. Um, and it is it completely flies in the face of the idea of free play and children being allowed to play in whatever way they want. Um, so I think, you know, we've talked a lot about the, the onus being on parents, guardians, caregivers, um, and, I, and I think each parent needs to make decisions for themselves about the level of risk, right? Um, so if a child wants to go and play close to another child on a playground and that child is in their class at school, then probably the risk is relatively low because they're going to be around that child all day anyway. My children after school will play on the playground, on their school playground, with the other kids who they're at school with. 
and we let them play on there and that's fine. But at the weekend I was in London and they wanted to go and play on a on the playground on South Bank. And I said, you know what, I don't think that's a good idea because those children are not children that they're interacting with all the time. And there were lots of children there. So I think it's about also as a caregiver or a parent making that judgment about what is the level of risk in this situation? How far are we from, from where we live, from the children that they're interacting with all the time? How many children are there there? If there's a big play space and there are only two other children playing there, it's unlikely that they're going to be close enough for a prolonged period of time for anything to be to be um, transmitted. You know, my understanding, David could probably comment on this as well, but is that just by kind of passing each other, it's unlikely unless at that point someone goes <coughs> in the other one's face and they happen to be breathing in at that moment that they're going to pass anything on. But if they want to play, you know, sit on the swing next to each other for half an hour, then maybe that's not the best idea. You know, but I don't think it's a black and white decision, is it? Ideally, children, we should be um, helping children to socially distance, but we need to be realistic about about that and about making sure that they have access to play and opportunity to play and social distancing doesn't mean that they therefore have to stay inside the whole time. So David I know that you do have to keep saying this over and over again but I think we'd all like you to say it again which is about how the risk of transmission between children is lower and the risk is mainly adult to adult or even adult to children because it reassures us so can you say it again? <laughs> um, well, you just said it for, yeah, and um, we can provide, via the Play Safety Forum, we can provide you with the academic references to this work for anybody who would like it and would like to include it in their risk assessment. We'd be happy to do that. Brilliant. Okay, so let me see if I can see what other, if anybody's got any more questions, you can put them into the chat. Sorry, Kevin, I didn't really understand what your question was, um, but so if you'd like to write it again, that'd be good. Um, how important do you think the panel for us to have a sort of written down assessment of the different possibility of transmission of different surfaces? I think people who are analyzing their playground equipment and their play sites are getting very caught up in whether wood holds the, the virus for longer amounts of time than plastic and or whether, you know, these sorts of questions. How important do we think those questions are? Is that um, I, to me? To me? Well, yeah. David, oh, let's go for well, you first um, and then come to Mark. Okay, well, um, I think it's um, probably pushing the research a bit harder than it's uh, capable of providing answers. I mean, there is research which says the virus has been measured on different surfaces, and if it's on metal, it survives so long, and if it's on wood, it survives so long. But, I mean, there are so many other questions around this it's not just about the survival on there it's about whether it remains infectious still whether it's viable or not and recent research suggests that it doesn't remain viable if it's outside um so there's so, and then the question is well how much virus do you need to infect a person anyway there may be some on the surface and somebody may put their hand on it and it might be viable but is it enough? We don't know the answer to those questions. So there's so much speculation in this um, chain from the presence of the stuff to whether someone's going to get COVID or not. But I don't really think there's a lot of point in debating whether plastic is better than wood or metal. Okay. I, I, I was actually going to say something very similar in that it, let's imagine that a surface actually is a really dangerous thing, then we probably wouldn't have allowed play areas or anywhere else to open, would we? Right, so, so common sense says it must be okay for people to use something, but then they should clean their hands. So regardless of whether it's wood, plastic, metal, or whatever it is, as long as there is the parental guidance responsibility to say 
hey kids, when you go in there, just put a little bit of this stuff on your hand. And when you come out, put a little bit of this stuff on your hand. You probably eliminate that. And I saw a question earlier on, which was an absolutely commonsensical thing to ask, is what's the point in cleaning if one kid has COVID, goes in and just puts that, it, it makes a bit of a nonsense of it. And it's these things that you need to acknowledge within your risk assessment. So you've acknowledged them and taken them into account. And as long as you've acknowledged them and taken them into account, you have done the risk assessment. Now, it is important, though, as I'm sure Tim would agree, is you have to take them into account. You can't just acknowledge them and then walk on. But as long as you do take them into account and realize, well, the mitigation of this is people need to cleanse. Now, how do I make sure people cleanse? Well, I can't force them to cleanse. I'll put a sign up and tell them and remind them to cleanse. Aha, okay. I, and, and so on. It really, it, I, I can't express enough. This really comes down to common sense. <laughs> yeah. Good. Um, okay. So um, just a, a sort of much more general question now, a slightly different focus, a, a question that's come up, um, and I guess it will be hard for you to answer, but I'm going to ask you anyway. What do you think is the future of play areas? So Helen, have you got any ideas? <laughs> I also <laughs> sorry. We are right now. Um, who you were asking yeah um, can you can you clarify the question a bit more <laughs> I guess it, I guess people are wondering you know going forward if they were, if they are about to invest in new play areas or they are thinking about how to adapt their play areas has there is there any amazing insights from those of you think all three of you thinking about these sorts of um, ideas to to give people a steer and I, and I, I think also you know any reassurance you can give us that this isn't the end of play for all children and, and we're going to end up trying to keep them two metres apart forever yeah. is, is what we like hearing over and over again. Yeah. Um, yeah. So two things to say. One's very positive, which is I think that lots of people have started talking about play and realising that play is important as a result of COVID who didn't previously. Um, you know, people who kind of play was frivolous and play is the thing that kids just get on with. And, and then people have realised, actually, we if we take it away, bad things happen. Um, so I, I feel quite positive about that, um, that moving forward, we might realise actually that it's really valuable to children and it might have a bit of a better standing in the world. Um, so that's good news. Um, in terms of the future of play areas and designing new play areas and investing in new play areas, my, from my perspective, I would say, you know, do not spend a whole load of money designing a play area that supports socially distanced play. Children don't need to play in that way. You don't need to spend a whole lot of money on fancy equipment that means there's one kid in a pod over there and one in a pod over there. Play areas need to be designed to meet the physical and psychological needs of children and they need to be together, not apart. Um, we will get through this at some point. We will either learn to live with this virus or we will work out a way of, of getting over it and play will go on. Um, so I think, you know, design good play areas, invest in good play areas and do not allow this to derail your idea of what a good play area looks like. Thanks, Helen. That was great. Mark, can I come to you with the same question? Yeah, sure. I, am, I, I think, and I, I think it's Helen's research that has proven this, is no matter how many times people say, well, you know, they can just play with a bit of wood outside or, oh, they can, you know, they can create, make their own swing or whatever. Yes, they can. They really can. But that's the lucky ones, right? The vast majority of the population of the UK, if you ask them, if you poll them, will tell you that the local play area is extremely important and is where they want the children to play. And there's, there's, actually, there's actually two reasons for it. One is the obvious one that kids want something, they want somewhere that's theirs. They want somewhere that they can go and they can be free and they can play and do their own thing. And in doing that, they get active with all the health benefits that that comes. 
But the second one is the play area in your locality is often a social hub. And it's probably, you know, Boris talks about leveling things up. You want to see leveling up, go to your local play area. You've got racial interaction, social interaction. You've got every possible interaction you can get. So I would hope and implore that the play area, and it doesn't have to be a fenced little bit around, right? It's the area where kids go to play is a very, very important part of our local communities. And, you know, we will continue to, to lobby and, and campaign that there should be more of them. Uh, they should be far better funded. Our biggest fear is that it has dropped down in terms of funding priority. If you're a local authority, regardless of whether you're a large metropolitan one, Kevin, or a really small one, funding next year is going to be tight. And when it comes to prioritizing things, you know, how much priority is it going to have? And I can only hope that what Helen said happens, that people realize the importance of this for social and mental health and, and actually put the, you know, the right resource, time and, and money into it. Great. Okay. And, and then David, if we can come to you with a similar question, which was about what, what's the future of play areas. I think there's also a theme running through around people's concern about um, having a challenge from parents or other people in the community around COVID if they keep their play areas open. Um, I'm not sure if you can say something about that. I'm not sure about that question, um, okay. as you put it. I mean, future of play areas, um, there has, I mean, in the last couple of decades, there's been mounting research showing how important play is. And incidentally, it's not just for children, but it's for old folks as well. And so that raises the question of why are we segregating play by age? Um, that seems to me to be a, a dubious thing to be doing. Um, and research also showing how important contact with the natural world is. Um, there was a paper published from Finland in the last couple of weeks which showed that children who are exposed to biological elements are more resistant to infections of all kinds. That wasn't particularly about COVID, but it might apply to COVID. So we need to integrate the kind of equipment which we traditionally see in playgrounds into more natural environments. Um, so I think that's another future which we might look at. Um, apart from, and as Mark says, get rid of the fences. It should be an open environment, part of society where people of all ages can mingle and interact together. So that's what I would hope for. Um, and I think the research is growing, um, which will support that initiative. Okay, brilliant. Right, I think we're going to wrap up. So I just want to say thank you very much for all of our panel members. The, the speeches were amazing. And um, I think the key messages that I've taken from that are that playgrounds are the number one place where children get to play, whether that's because adults see that that's a place where children can play or whether the children themselves identify those pieces of equipment or that area as being the place to play. I, I don't think it really matters, but it just emphasizes how important those spaces are. I think another big takeaway was um, that you explained very clearly, Mark, that it's actually up to local operators to decide whether to keep their spaces open or not. Even in the highest tier of current COVID um, regulations, they can stay open. And the basic thing that people need to be able to do is a risk assessment. I think there is a lot of concern um, around about what those risk assessments need to have in them. And there's always concerns about challenges. But as David has pointed out, if you can clearly explain why you've done what you've done, then you should be able to stand up for your decision um, and, it, and it needs to be practical. 